thank you for coming to this session because this is going to be the best of the parallel sessions. Um, mostly because of the quality of the panel that I have. I can't believe that I get to moderate uh, people of this quality. Um, so I'm going to do a quick intro so you know who you have in the room because I notice the programs are, are light on information. Um, uh, I'm not going to ask Chris to sing, but any of you that were there at dinner last night will know uh, this 25 years of professional opera singer, right, Chris? Um, but Chris is also a director of, the, of NCATS at, at NIH. Uh, Amitab, to my right, is a professor uh, at Harvard uh, Kennedy uh, School of Government. Uh, with uh, a lot of publications on innovation. Uh, Peggy Hamburg, uh, former commissioner of the FDA, um, and lots, lots of other exciting stuff, and now foreign secretary of the National Academy of Medicine. Um, Jennifer Miller uh, uh, is a founder of Bioethics International, the founder of the Good Pharma Scorecard, a way of measuring uh, ethics within the industry, and is a professor at Yale School of Medicine. And Jason Spangler is, uh, is currently with Amgen. Uh, he uh, is a, a focus on value and quality and health economics within that, uh, within that role. So uh, remarkable breadth. Uh, and uh, one thing I want to acknowledge is the quality of the uh, audience too. So thank you for coming to this meeting. I'm hoping to make you a part of the conversation uh, as, as we go through. Um, but one thing I want to really uh, begin with is this, this, the title that we have here is discussing cultures of innovation. Um, uh, in my company, we, every year we publish the annual Pharmaceutical Innovation Index, uh, which is a ranking of the top 30 companies for their ability to launch innovation. And one of the first things that we did there was really to define what we mean by innovation. Uh, and definitions are certainly very helpful to the process of trying to make things better. Um, uh, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about culture, but I'm very interested in how this panel would define uh, in innovation. Uh, we have a very simple rule at IDEA, which is it's about the return on invention. So separating invention and innovation was very critical to the way that we were able to do this. But um, Chris, maybe if you could kick us off with you know, how you would define innovation and then perhaps how you would define culture. Uh, too. Yeah, um, so my definition is probably broader than lots of yours because NCAT's mission is actually to go everything from target validation to public health. And so we consider not only the, the uh, therapeutic development process, but also uh, we think a lot of the biggest translational problems in translational science and culture problems are after, actually after a drug is approved or, or a, an intervention is shown to be potentially useful. Um, and, uh, and so we spend a lot of time thinking about this question of innovation because NCATS is in many ways uh, uh, intended to be the venture space for NIH. Um, and so a couple things that I've put in place to encourage that. Uh, one is, um, is to uh, relentlessly steal the Apple think different uh, uh, mantra that I quote all the time. The other is to establish a principle that, uh, that because the translational space is so fraught with failure and, and inefficiency, that the default pathway should be to not do it the way it's always been done. And you know, human beings are not good at this. When, you, when, when, when you, they start out to do something, they look at what everybody else has done, and they, they follow that path. And that would be perfectly rational if, if we had a well-established, successful process, but we don't. And, and, and so when you give people permission to, to say, no, 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 turn your head upside down, and, and, and I, you can only do what's been done before, if you can convince me that this time the outcome's gonna be different. And that's amazingly liberating to, 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 to people's, uh, people's thinking. Uh, the other uh, a mantra that we have at our place is that everything is an experiment. People get really wigged out if they think that, uh, that what they're doing is not only new but permanent. And so uh, if you say, look, everything is an experiment, we're going to try this, we're going to gather data. If it works, great, we'll continue it. If it doesn't, we're going to stop. And so that also is very liberating at allowing people to, uh, to do things that are, that are different. Uh, the other thing that we've done, and a lot of you do, is, is uh, to pay really careful attention to incentives um, that, that uh, you know, as, as we all know, people are really good at following incentives. 
you know, look no further than the, the five cents you would have to pay for a plastic bag at the grocery store. You know, people will do anything to save that five cents yeah. at the grocery store. You know, so it doesn't have to be much, but they're, they're very finely attuned. And often what we find is that much as people talk about uh, uh, innovation, um, they, the incentives are actually mitigating the, in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about that. Uh, the other two really simple things which I learned from mentors early in my career that I found really helpful is, uh, is as the person uh, who, who is the uh, leader of this organization, uh, and, and this is going to sound funny, but uh, uh, is to model ignorance. That is to ask dumb questions on purpose in group settings. Sometimes I actually don't know the answer, but sometimes I do know the answer. But what that does is give all the people around you permission. Because they say, well, gosh, if Chris asked this question, then you know, I guess I can ask anything. And that's, again, really liberating. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I would do, which was, again, uh, perhaps a little un... Uh, you might not think of this as the first thing. Um, a culture of, of, uh, of laughter is actually very important to our center. And, if, and when neurobiologists have actually studied this, why, what laughter is, is, an, is, is being attuned to an unexpected result. And so what laughter does neurobiologically is puts your brain in a mode where it's ready to receive different information. Mm. And that's what laughter is. And that's what you want in innovation. That's awesome. Uh, well, I feel my job here is to model ignorance. I think that's <laughs> and, <laughs> and make us and laugh. Some stupid, and, and make you laugh at the same time. So, um, thank you, uh, Amitab. And definitions of innovation and culture. So, so I'm 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 the, you know, I'm I'm an economist. So I feel like I'm the skunk at the garden party. Like I'm not <laughs> I'm not the guy who can really define culture. In fact, if I defined it. I think I would be forced to watch the Kardashians and drink kombucha for the rest of my life. So <laughs> culture is like a really squishy thing and uh. we just really don't like squishy things. So, um, so I would, for me, it's all about incentives for innovation. Um, but, but, but thinking about innovation, you know, how do I define innovation? I think of innovation as being any product, any process, any device, any drug, any treatment, any surgery, that increases value for patients where value is either an improvement in outcomes but no, no increase in price or a decrease in price but no change in outcomes. So as long as we are producing value to patients using my definition of value and it's a product or a process that does that, I would call it an innovation. Mm -hmm. And if it can't do that, if it can't improve outcomes or lower price, it's allowed to in increase outcomes and increase price, but it has to increase outcomes more than it increases price. If it does that, I would call that kind of product or technology or surgery or drug uh, innovation. And you said increase price. Did you mean increase or decrease? No, it's fine for something to increase okay. price yep. as long as it increases outcomes more than the increase in price. I mean, yeah. the holy grail would be, the holy grail of innovations would be uh, something like the flu shot, right, that improves outcomes and actually reduces the social price yeah. of the flu, yeah. right? But those, the things that improve outcomes and actually reduce prices are rare. So I'm willing to say yeah. it's okay if your outcome in increases prices as long as it increases prices less than it increases the numerator, which is outcomes, to the patient. For sure. And your culture... It's about the system of incentives rather than system anything. of incentives. Okay. That's exactly right. The five cents yeah. that Chris is talking about. That's yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Peggy. Well, I want to build a little bit, not on the culture comments yeah. as much as on the innovation. <laughs> um, I mean, to me, innovation means trying new things, whether it's developing new products or um, uh, new. Uh, uh, approaches and strategies, uh, but in the context of biomedical innovation and what we're trying to accomplish in terms of getting new, better, hopefully cheaper pro medical products to people, then my definition of innovation is it needs to matter for patients. Mm -hmm. And it comes mm -hmm. down to some of the 
the elements that Amitav was describing in more economic terms, but it's really, you know, is it a product that, that, that does what it says it mm -hmm. does? Do the benefits outweigh the risks? Um, is it a product that patients uh, can use and have access to, including affordability? Um, and at the end of the day, um, does it make a difference for patients? Um, and you know, we'll come back to this probably, but I think one of the things is that innovation for innovation's sake in this context isn't the goal. Mm -hmm. The goal is innovations that work. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where sometimes false um, conflicts between regulation and innovation, I think, come into play. But moving on to culture, I think, again, in this context, culture is something we're still struggling to achieve, but even the, the composition of this panel, I think, speaks to progress. In the world of biomedical innovation, I think culture is really breaking down the silos of the different components of the biomedical um, uh, product uh, research, uh, development, innovation, ecosystem, and, and getting people to talk to each other, work together, and recognize how the different components of the ecosystem affect each other. You know, going from issues like information, um, patents, and IP mm. to economic policies, to investments in science and what kind of science and the balance, to the regulatory issues, to the reimbursement issues. Um, and some would even argue, you know, you have to extend it to immigration policy and a mm -hmm. few other things that matter for a robust innovation ecosystem. But it's really, I think, when I think about culture, it's, it's breaking down the silos, recognizing that this is fundamentally a partnership and an active dynamic ecosystem and we have to get our incentives to align, we have to get a common level of understanding and we have to all be moving in the same direction which is ultimately to harness the power of science for patients. That's cool. So that's two non-squishy definitions of culture just so you know. Yeah. The, uh, Jennifer, definitely define and uh, both of those ideas. Yeah, so as a good academic I always have notes, sorry. <laughs> um, so. Etymologically, the word innovation simply means to introduce something new. In that sense, it doesn't mean the innovation doesn't have to be better, safer, more efficacious, more cost effective, more affordable, more accessible. Now, as a bioethicist, uh, I'm more interested in cultivating products and services less for the sake of novelty and more for the sake of three, with three outcomes. One, that they are patient centered or more likely human centered, because preventative care might fall more towards the latter, that they're trustworthy and ethical, and that they're focused on optimally advancing health and well-being for all people. Um, so that's my bit on innovation. And then when I think about how do we build a culture that would operationalize those three values, there are five common strategies for affecting change in a firm or a sector, and they tend to be, you can use laws to regulate behaviors, civil society activism like boycotts, um, legal act action, pressure from investors, or education programs that rely on the art of persuasion. These strategies all have merit, but they've actually all been used to different degrees in the healthcare sector. Um, so as Mike knows, I've spent a lot of time asking and researching how can you create change in a sector, and it turns out there's a method that almost every industry, from tuna to diamonds to the education field, have used, and it's the implementation of an accreditation, certification, rating, ranking. Uh, type of system to help define, measure, signal, and improve a, a quality, whatever that quality is. Um, so I've spent a lot of time sort of playing around with this idea of whether this building such an index for healthcare innovation um, could succeed at promoting patient centricity, ethics, trustworthiness, um, and a focus on improving health and well-being for all patients. Awesome. Thank you very much. And Jason, you get to round us off. Yeah. So I have advantage of being at the end. I can just say, you know, ditto. <laughs> what they said. I agree with everything <laughs> they've said there. Um, uh, so I'll just add a few, you know, a few things. Um, you know, for a company like ours, we're kind of known as an innovative company. We develop innovative therapies. Um, we as a company, though, want to go beyond just innovation in the biopharma area. So in drug development, go beyond that. So we also think of innovation in terms of manufacturing. How can we be more innovative in how we manufacture? Can we, can we have a, a smaller, you know, environmental space and still develop 
better medicine. So we look at it that way. Can we develop, you know, not just reference or innovative brand therapies, but also, you know, we're big in biosimilars and you need to be innovative in doing that and how you can do that. Even going beyond that, we want to be innovative in policy areas. We want to think beyond kind of our current paradigms that we have and think that, you know, we're not just a, a company that develops therapies. We're also a company that thinks that the healthcare system is important. And there are changes that need to be made around incentives and how we focus on patients with the healthcare system. Pricing needs to be innovative. We're, we're in a, you know, some call it the, you know, the, the biocentury. We're developing therapies that are um, very different, very much more effective, but also very different pricing mechanisms, and some are very expensive. How do we become more innovative in how we think about our pricing and our payment mechanisms? Uh, and, and also, you know, how do we become innovative in just our overall finance models? You know, the way that we've done things in the past, going what has been said already, it needs to change. The paradigms need to change. So we, we want to be innovative in all those areas. Um, from a culture perspective, I would say there's two things that kind of stand out at a, at a company like ours, and not that we're unique, but in some ways maybe is, one is, we're always told to think big, think bold. Don't think small, and don't think that something is too big or too bold. And don't let excuses, whether they're you know, financial or processes or, or bureaucratic or whatever, limit how you're thinking about things. So be bold in how you think about new ideas. The other is, and going along with what's also been said, is you have to create an environment where people are willing to fail and that it's okay to fail, to take risks and fail. People are going to fail. In our industry, there's a lot of failure. There's more failure than success, as you probably know, in, in drug development. But you have to have an environment where that's okay um, and still be able to evaluate people's performance, but be willing to, you, you want people to take risks. You want people to think big, take risks. If they fail, that's okay, because out of those you know, risk-taking are going to come the big innovative ideas, whether it's developing the newest therapy for a, a rare disease uh, or a, a, an unmet need, um, or you know, whether it's developing a new policy that you know, can change how our healthcare system you know, focuses more on patients and on value. Awesome, thank you. And because you went last, first question to you, really. Oh, no, I, I got to keep uh -huh. on last yeah. so I can <laughs> So <laughs> I think, so I'd be interested in your perspective, given that you work for Amgen and given that you have this think big, think bold, how do you measure innovation currently, internally? How do you know that you're getting what you want? So I think some of the traditional ways. Um, so, you know, we kind of like what Amitabh said and Jennifer said, we look at the value of the therapies we're developing. So first, you know, our, our mission is to serve patients. So how does it benefit patients, mm -hmm. first of all? So can historically, you, can, we as a- Can you give me an example of what you mean by that? So numbers of products, numbers of- Yeah, added, so well, added, I would say, so. let me go back up a little bit. So when we first were a company, you know, we want to unmet need. So where patients were not getting any therapies at all, and that's kind of where yeah. we focused historically. Yeah. So getting a, a therapy or developing a therapy where there wasn't any therapies or any good therapies. Um, now I think we, we still do that, but it's shifted towards areas where there is still unmet need, but there might be larger populations. You know, things that areas where, you know, patients, either the therapies don't work that well, or, you know, there are good therapies, but sometimes, you know, patients, there are certain subpopulations of patients that may not respond. And mm. so it's, it's basically about patients and unmet need. Um, but again, going back to the value, you know, how is the outcome being improved mm. at like, you know, the outcomes over, over cost equation mm. with cost staying the same, but if costs are going to increase, which some of these, because of the, the innovation that it takes and the resources it takes to develop these medicines, is the outcome greater mm. than what's out there already? Okay. So I think that's how we measure it. Okay. And, and, and just to help me and, and the audience, so have you established baselines and are you looking to annually to improve on those or is this a general sense that we're moving in the yeah, right direction? I think, I think it's both. We obviously have annual, you know, metrics yeah. about how we're doing, you yeah. know, whether it's financial or scientific. Yeah. Um, but also we are a company that also wants to look long term. Right. Um, and, and so not just be limited by the short term thinking yeah. um, that, that we do see in other areas in healthcare. Okay, and uh, maybe Peggy, if I could throw you the same question, because clearly you have very hard objective measures of whether the FDA has been innovative, for example. Is it measured? Is it baselined? What does good look like? Well, are you talking about measuring innovation? Or are you talking about measuring performance in our mission? Yeah, um, both of those, those I guess. Are yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that you know, clearly we have a range. We, you know, I still talk about we, um, meaning the FDA, but the FDA 
has, you know, all kinds of different standards and measures for um, how to assess a product, both in the, um, the pre-approval and approval process, but also in, in the post-market space as well. Um, and there are all kinds of different measures that are used. Some people think is measuring innovation. Some people think is measuring performance, like you know how many new drugs are approved a year, um, how quickly, um, how many safety problems have emerged in the post-market phase, et cetera. But many of those things can actually be quite misleading if you're only right. looking at the numbers. Yep. This is a very dynamic process. And you, you have to start somewhere. So you start with smaller, um, more focused studies to, to ask and answer a set of critical questions about safety, efficacy, quality, and performance. But everyone recognizes that no matter how well you design those upfront studies, you're not getting all the information you need because you're working with a smaller number of patients. You're often working with people who have been selected because they don't have a lot of comorbidities and right. other complicating factors in their lives. And they're taking the medication or using the device under much more controlled um, circumstances. Then you go out into the real world and um, you both have many more numbers of individuals using these products and also um, in a much messier context in terms of other diseases, other drugs that they're taking, um, uncertainty about, um, you know, are they following the actual um, mm. uh, prescription uh, patterns of use, uh, et cetera. So you learn things in that context and, you know, often, Certainly when I was FDA commissioner, if a, if a safety issue would emerge in that post-market space, I was often hauled in front of Congress about, you know, how did you let this safety issue happen? Right. But that is not necessarily a failure of the system. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a reality of a dynamic process where we're always collecting more information and the, the, the failure would come if there weren't systems that recognize that that could identify an emerging problem and if you didn't act on it. So I think that's really Im important to recognize. And one of the things that I pushed back on a lot when I was at the FDA was this notion that we were going to be measured by how fast our review times were and how many new drugs were approved. Um, because if those were our sole goals, you know, you FDA just could just approve anything that passes, crosses the threshold. Um, and, you know, we'd be first in the world on everything, but got to come back to meaningful innovation, you know, means that the product has to work and um, it has to do what it claims to do. And, um, and the FDA's responsibility is to, you know, really work with the scientific research community and the product sponsor to learn as much as you can but then recognize that it really has to be a, a lifespan approach. So I, I guess, you know, yes, we have lots of, of standards and, and measures, but, you know, you always have to be putting that into context. You don't necessarily need the numbers to grow every year. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I'd be interested in throwing this question to Chris as well, because clearly you have probably more to measure uh, mm -hmm. where, where you are than we do at the kind of up at the sharp end of, of, of approvals. Mm -hmm. um, what do you measure? Why do you measure it? Well, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, it, it was pointed out to us uh, shortly after I became director of NCATS is that, <clears throat> that, that NCATS actually ha is the only institute or center at the NIH with a verb in the name. <laughs> <laughs> and that verb, that verb is advancing. Right. Advancing. And so we take that seriously. And if you're going to know whether you're advancing translational science, not just doing it, but if you're advancing, you've got to have a T0 and a T1 and a T4. You've got to measure everything. You've got to have a ground state, and then you've got to measure. Right? And, then, and that itself is a science, how to measure that. Mm. And, and so we tied ourselves in knots trying to figure out, well, you know, the ultimate endpoint, as we often say, is getting more treatments to more patients more quickly. But, and that's, that is our outcome, but, but, but that, that's, a very, that's a distal outcome, right? So, um, so uh, it is possible, uh, and we've done this partially through uh, a 
program that we did at the National Academy of Medicine that, um, uh, with a whole bunch of colleagues on mapping this, uh, this process. And you know, it's conservatively about a 20, 25 step process uh, from beginning to end. Um, and, uh, and we actually made a traffic map, like a Google map of what parts are red, what parts are yellow, what parts are green. And, and then, and then you, can, you can actually do, like you do on a traffic map, you can measure you know, velocity. And, what you're, and, and, and then what you're trying to do is, is, is change the conversation from velocity, what the current velocity is, and focus on, on acceleration. And, and, so, and, and so we've broken down the problem into uh, a ste uh, sort of intermediate steps, these intermediate outcomes that are measurable so we can figure out whether we are advancing or not. And if you look at the name of our, our, uh, uh, of our, uh, our hosts, uh, 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 and, and, and faster cure, you know, faster cures means acceleration. That's what it is. And so, so often we think about innovation ultimately about accelerating something, but as Peggy turned, uh, uh, pointed out, it's not just doing something faster, because it's really the easiest way to do something faster is to do it badly. Uh, but, uh, so they can't be the only measure. Right. Uh, but, 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 but I, you know, and this is, interestingly, it's a, it gets back into the culture issue, interestingly, because scientists, at least academic scientists, are not very good at this. You know, they, they tend to say things, well, you know, there, it's, a, it's an ineffable quality which my work has. And, 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 and one can't put a, 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 a you know, sort of a, a, a quantitation on that, you know, maybe 20 years before, which is true, before something is, uh, is found. Uh, but I think uh, many times that's just a cop out. Mm -hmm. I think it actually is possible, um, it's particularly in the translational space. In the fundamental space, Probably not well, that's so easily, but in the translational space, I think you can, uh, because we, we have we're much more. If you know this this terminology, if you don't, you, you should recommend that you look at it. This is Lou Stokes, uh, you know, the quad, four quadrants of innovation, uh, and we live in translation is in Pasteur's quadrant, not Bohr's quadrant, and and that means we are starting out with a need. That's what defines that space, and you're working backwards. So 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 that means that you ought to be able to figure out whether you're making progress getting there. But you have to do it intentionally, and you have to create oh. a culture of, a, of, of an organization where, where acceleration uh, or measuring advancement is part of what you do. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I hate to break in, but often also different types of science have to be brought together mm -hmm. to really yep. maximize yep. Sure. that acceleration opportunity. And for yep. example, once it was recognized about the value of surrogate endpoints yep. and, and biomarkers, suddenly you could accelerate the translation of new understandings in science into products right. in the you know, marketplace for people yep. making a difference. And it was, it, it, it was the conceptual innovation of, of doing clinical trials differently yep. that made that possible. Or you know, there are certain areas where you can be committed to acceleration as much as you want, but until certain levels of scientific understanding gotcha. yeah. of the underlying mechanism of disease or points of opportunity for intervention are elucidated, you know, you're not going to get that breakthrough. So, you know, I think we have to, to think about having facilitating systems yeah. and then making sure we're doing the right science. Yeah. And I think that idea of the mm -hmm. traffic mapping, if you like, mm -hmm. the kind of uh, the ecosystem mapping, if yeah. you like, because actually what doesn't tend to happen in a lot of pharma companies is that the, is that the system gets mapped. Mm -hmm. you, know, you tend to look at the, the kind of sequential yeah. baton passing rather than the kind yeah. of, you know, where, where you've got a red and a, and a green. Um, maybe just to elevate that to the kind of almost geographic level, I know Amitab, you've got some thoughts on the geography, concentrations geographically of, of, of innovation. Yeah, so, you know, I think we spend correctly a lot of time thinking about uh, push incentives for innovation like NIH funding, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about pull incentives for innovation, like patents and exclusivity periods. But what we don't spend a lot of time talking about is some of the points that Chris and Peggy and Jason have made, which is that even if you have the right incentives, places, areas may vary in their ability to respond to those incentives. And so, um, you know, I've got some slides for you that I thought might be helpful. Um, so, you know, one point I just wanted to make is that biopharma bio innovation is incredibly concentrated. It is 
more concentrated than any other industry known to mankind. So if you look at software patenting and you ask what share of software patenting occurs in San Francisco, you know, it's, it's, it's large, but it turns out to be smaller than the amount of biotech innovation that happens in the leading three cities. So if you have a slide up, that would be great. Um, next slide, yeah, and, and, and just kind of go to the next one, yep. Yeah, so you can just kind of see like, you know, something like biotech, that the three cities that do the most patenting in biotech account for a third of all worldwide patents. There's no other industry as concentrated as this. And why is this important? This is important because we spend very little time understanding what is special about these cities that are actually able to produce these patents. If we understood that well, as opposed to just advanced storytelling. So advanced storytelling is when someone says, well, gee, of course, it's all about Harvard University and MIT. That's just advanced storytelling. I mean, we'd like to know what is it about industrial policy, state policy, location, the ability to fail and learn from each other, the ability to bring different types of science together that these cities have that other cities don't have. So if we go to the next slide, I can put some um, actual numbers to this. So the blue bars are telling us how many patents per year were produced in biotech since 2010. So when you see Boston in blue at 150, it means in any given year between 2010 and 2017, on average, Boston produced 150 more patents, so it's a relative, than the typical American city. San Francisco produced about 120 more patents. And, and, and these cities together, these are the top 10 in America, account for all the patents. Now, patents are not innovation, going back to the definitions of innovation we were using. Patents don't necessarily mean that something that increases value will come out. But patents are like a proto-innovation. You need a patent to sort of, you know, to sort of produce that drug 20 years later. One of the questions that I was interested in was to ask, gee, how much of the innovative capacity of Boston and San Francisco is really that they just do a lot of innovation in general, that they have this culture of innovation? So they're patenting in chemicals and they're patenting in manufacturing. And it turns out that like if you control, now don't advance, go right back to the previous slide. If you control for sort of all the other patenting that happens, look at the gap between San Francisco and Boston. San Francisco's ability to patent in the life sciences is actually, a lot of it, more than half of it is accounted for, is explained by its ability to just patent in general. Boston's is not. There's some unique ability to patent in, in biotech. And what's interesting is, this was not true if I showed you the data for 2000 to 2010. So something changed. Mm -hmm. We don't know what changed and why it changed, but something changed. And we should understand this because it is profoundly important for what comes to market 15 years from now. Mm -hmm. And it could land up being as important as all the things we spend so much time talking mm -hmm. about, right? This ability to fail, this ability to bring the scientists together, this ability to do the translational research better is important. Now, if we go to the next slide, um, if you go back in time, you know, what's also interesting is, you know, one small, I like to go to the FDA for things, and so if someone said, you know, what are the truly innovative drugs? I like to say, well, I don't know, but let's just see what the FDA would call breakthrough drugs. Look at the origin of patents for breakthrough drugs. Something like 40% of them actually originate in San Francisco. Biotech innovation is not a zero-sum game. It is not the case that if San Francisco brings a patent to market, a Boston inventor can't bring another patent to market. So in terms of the origins of, of really great drugs and the patents for those drugs, not the companies that brought them to market. So I'm not saying these drugs were brought to market by companies based in San Francisco. I'm just saying the inventors mm -hmm have addresses that are listed in San Francisco. What was so special about doing invention if you were a UCSF scientist that allowed you to do it in San Francisco and at this time period at a rate that is, you know, three times, four times higher than, this, than a city like Boston? We don't know. We've not spent a lot of time understanding this kind of part of the ecosystem. And I think to me as an economist, this is sort of the culture of innovation. It's like, what are the unique incentives in these cities that cause this proto-innovation to emerge? And why can't it emerge in other cities, in other great cities? I don't know. So I have two other slides that I think, um, I would love to ask the panelists what they think of them. The next slide is just making a, a point that when we talk about innovation, 
you know, one question that I have as an economist, going back to the definitions I used earlier, was are we getting the right kind of innovation? I don't know the answer, but in blue on the left are the total number of FDA drug approvals, and on the right are the orphan drug approvals. And you can see the orphan approvals are somewhere between 30 to 50 percent of all approvals. Now, this is a great thing. I mean, we've, the, the, the Orphan Drug Act works, so this is not a problem. But from a societal burden of disease point of view, the, I want to ask, gee, what can we do to induce innovation in non-orphan diseases, right? That's really where we want innovation in addition to orphan diseases. And let me be very clear, it's not like because we brought an orphan drug to market, we can't bring a non-orphan drug to market. It's not a zero-sum game. And so my last slide is just on the very last page. Um, this is just, if you open up the R&D pipeline for just for phase one, phase two, phase three trials, and you look at how many molecules we're studying broken down by diseases, you can see point number one, that the R&D pipeline is very skewed away from the social burden of disease. Mm -hmm. Cancer is 15% of the disease burden as measured by deaths and as measured by the number of years of life people live with cancer but it's 30% of the R&D. Mm -hmm. Mental health is 15% of the disease burden, but less than 2% of the R&D, so that's a problem. What about Parkinson's? Parkinson's is a huge problem in, in America and around the world, but you can count off the number of Parkinson's uh, trials. Uh, you know, we have something like 212 products under investigation for Parkinson's, and we probably need more than 1,000. And the same is true for infectious disease, where I think in something like infectious disease, which kills most people around the world, right now we have you know, a, a number of drugs being studied, but again, relative to the burden of disease, it's very little. So as an economist, I look at this and I say, you know, we need to be thinking about what incentives can improve the performance of this table. And I think back to regulatory incentives, pricing incentives, intellectual property incentives, but I also just wanted to introduce the, the point that maybe some of this, not all of it, some of it could just be addressed by the, the geography of where the innovation happens. So, so let's, let's jump back to that, because I don't think Boston is going to be the answer to all of this, right? No, no. Uh, <laughs> In fact, that's the point. We yeah, know yeah. it's not the answer right. any of yeah. this, right? So, I'm yeah, curious, yeah. did you break down the patents coming from academic institutions versus companies? Yeah, so here we just look, by the way, here, Peggy, we're looking at the address of the inventor, regardless mm -hmm. of whether it was academic or a company. Um, in our data, you can look at the recipient of the patent. Was it the Broad Institute? Was it Harvard Medical School? Was it MIT? Or was it Biogen? Mm -hmm. And so unsurprisingly, a disproportionate share of these patents are given to academics. But unsurprisingly, the commercialization is not done by the patent, by the, by the academics. Mm -hmm. you know? So the university right. licensing office right. might, might right. file for the patent, right. but they're not commercializing and they're not responsible for the phase one, phase right. two, phase three. Right. Right? And that's that ecosystem at work. That's that right. culture of innovation right. that I think right. we don't understand very well. Yeah. And just to, just to kind of dwell on that culture piece, that, you know, that what hypotheses might you have for why, say, Boston has exploded? Is it about adjacency? Is it about capital that's right, sitting next to the inventor, you know, maybe, you know, what, what would Amgen see as a kind of, you know, buyer of this kind of stuff? You know, what, <laughs> what, what things tend to lead to good stuff happening? Is it about being, you know, Thousand Oaks is in the middle of nowhere. So Yeah, so I, I can explain <laughs> why, why things started in Thousand Oaks, you know, so, you know, back in the late 70s and early 80s when Amgen was created, you know, it was equidistant between Los Angeles and Santa Barbara. And that's why they picked Thousand Oaks, because Santa Barbara at the time was kind of high tech, also had a university. L.A. obviously had multiple universities, but also had a large medical center. Mm -hmm. So that's why they decided to, you know, to be right in the middle. And, and I think about that when I when and I don't know if it's the chicken or the egg um, and maybe it's a combination of both. But if you look at cities that have reinvented themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, and a good example of this it, that people might know is Pittsburgh has completely reinvented itself over the last 15. I, I trained in Pittsburgh actually at, at uh, UPMC there. Um, but what they say is it's meds and eds. It's medicine and education. Mm. And that's what where innovation, that's where tech companies want to go. 
Um, so I, I think it's some sort of combination. What's the question, and I am going to talk about this before, is there's plenty of places where there's lots of universities yes. and health systems or medical centers. Um, why don't they have, you yeah. know, um, I'm, I'm not sure the answer to that. I think that's part of the answer is the, the amount. And you look at Boston, you look at San Francisco, you know, great universities, um, great medical centers um, in both. But, but there must be something more because there are other cities that have the, you know, that have, you know, similar circumstances. But, I, you know, I know for us that's part of it. And that's why I, I think the, the reason we wanted to not be in places that had that, but we wanted to be um, you know, places that were accessible to that, to be in a brand new space. And, you know, the other thing, I'm sure part of it was, I don't know this for sure, but, you know, I'm sure real estate was cheap in Thousand Oaks and maybe it was farmland and stuff like that. So you could you could build something from scratch and, and you know, expand as much as you want. But but I'm not sure exactly what more um, than that. I, I just know that that's part of it for yeah, us. And, and, has, and just help me, has Amgen done any of those outposts to Cambridge and some? Yeah, we have an office in Cambridge. We have an office in South San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of the, you know, the, a lot of the discovery and innovation goes there. Um, and then we have, you know, manufacturing in, in, in other places, some close, like Providence. We have a big manufacturing plant, Greenwich, which is near Providence. So it's close to Boston. Uh, you know, we, we used to have a, a, um, an office in Seattle, so kind of another innovative city, so to speak, or a high-tech city. So, and were they with a the goal of harnessing that cultural difference, or was it to spread the Amgen kind of I think it was a combination of both. I mean, it, it's a combination of, you know, there are a lot, there's a lot of innovation happening. There's a lot of discovery. There's a lot of invention going on. We should be in those areas. But it's also, I think, you know, we want to attract talent too, and, and, and we want to have people who work for our company in those areas so they can, you know, they're already in that area, in those cities, and we want them to be part of our company, but also we want to also learn from the other innovative thinking that's going on. Okay, and I want to pick up on uh, Amitabh's point about the, uh, are we getting the innovation that we want? And, and Jennifer, just to come back to your kind of measure, signal, improve kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, series, um, you set out to measure innovation in a very particular way. Can you, can you just describe quickly you know, what you did and how you went about identifying the right things to measure? Yeah, so patents I think are one signal of, potential signal for innovation. Um, but I can also think of a lot of patents that were given out to products like Nexium that were perhaps not so innovative. Um, so what I've been trying to do is create measures for what it means to have a good pharmaceutical sector, a good pharmaceutical company, one that's patient-centered, trustworthy, and, um, and ethical. And so I've so far come up with six measures. You can come up with measures, and then you have to figure out the data points of how to actually measure. But things that uh, I'm looking at are, first, the integrity of the clinical trial design. Um, I'm, I'm interested in looking at whether the data produced from the clinical trial is generalizable to the patient that actually, you know, the typical patient with a disease. Um, a lot of our drugs are tested on healthier, younger, whiter, sometimes more male um, populations than the patients who end up taking drugs, so I'm looking at that. Uh, I'm also looking at patient engagement in the trial design process and a lot of other things, but that's the first category of issues that I'll look at. The second one is I'm looking at how the actual clinical trial is conducted. Conservatively, 40 to 60 percent of clinical trials are done outside of the U.S. There's some really good things about this, like we're globalizing and democratizing information. We want to know how drugs work for different populations around the world. But there are also some big ethics challenges, like what if the clinical trial is one of the only ways for somebody to get access to healthcare? Um, or is the trial responsive to the local population's needs? So if you're an ethicist, you know the document called the Helsinki Declaration. And in there, it's very clear that we need to run clinical trials in populations where the indication being studied is responsive to their needs. And so the question is, are we testing drugs for male pattern baldness and allergy medicines on people who need more basic things like TB drugs and, and clean water? We need to measure those things. Um, also, do we make the drugs available for sale in the countries where we test them? Uh, a new study coming out, which I can't, it's under embargo, but not always is the shorthand answer. Um, and there's clearly a patient population there if you decided to run the trial there. The third thing that I look at is um, the communication of clinical trial results. Are all of the clinical trial results put in the public space or is there some selective reporting or selective outcome reporting? And then data sharing practices. And then fourth and fifth, I'll look at um, marketing practices. 
you know, is the information consistent across the DTC ads with what's in the FDA label, with what's in the paper? Um, there's a lot of concern about companies spending more money marketing products than researching and developing new ones. And I'm getting a lot of questions from socially responsible investors for a metric that standardizes the measure for R&D spend across com companies. So apparently it's hard to compare what everyone puts in their annual report as R&D spending. It's not using necessarily the same variables. Um, and then finally, I'm ultimately looking at the accessibility of the medicine, which of course includes pricing, but it includes a lot more things like anti-competitive practices, pay to delay tactics. If an originator company pays a generic um, company to pay out of, to stay out of the market, evergreening, things like that. Um, and then increasingly, the role of big data. Um, are we getting informed consent? Do we need to get informed consent if we're access accessing electronic health records and other types of health data, and what should that look like? So I think those are the five to six things that I'm yeah. in uh, uh, measure. So to, and, and to kind of Chris's idea of nudge being an important factor, have you seen this change behavior since you? Did yeah. So it? this. So the idea. So I created something called the Good Pharma Scorecard, which bench, which ranks companies and their products every year on the different ethics performance criteria, and it started out as an experiment. It was, just, would this work? There seemed to be a lot of evidence in the literature and from other things that it could work. And it, in our case, has completely worked. Um, just in the last index, three companies changed their policies and practices to score well. We just started this new thing where we tell companies their scores and give them 30 days to change practices and policies. Um, it was this nerdliest experiment, and it, it completely works. Companies um, are often willing to change practices when they get an opportunity to learn what their peers are doing, and also to get, it's in a sense, free consulting about what matters to patients and stakeholders and how they're scoring relative to different um, benchmarks that people want to see. You know, yeah. if I can just jump in here, you know, I think this is really terrific, and it's clearly moving the ball in important ways. But I think it still doesn't bridge us to the issue that Amitabh raised, which is really important that we don't want to forget, which is um, the misalignment mm -hmm. of the, the unmet medical yep. care and public health needs yep. and what's in the pipeline and so, what are the incentives. Yeah. So, and, and that's not going to end up being driven by the, the policies and practices of individual companies. Oh. It's a much bigger mm -hmm. societal discussion mm -hmm. well, and but commitment. Even, even bigger than that, if we're really going to talk about advancing health, you'd have to talk about all the social determinants of health. Well, I mean, so I mean, you can, you can make it as big as you want, but I think everyone has to work in their. But if we, if we come yeah. back, and, and to Peggy's point, so you've clearly been involved in essentially proofs of concept, right? So you know, orphan designation before your period, but things like breakthrough have changed the needle on what you've got. You know, coming out the other side. Um, are there more of those initiatives coming through to reflect societal and met need? Well, some of those um, have clearly worked and have given us some lessons about incentives that, that, that matter and, and frameworks. And I think the breakthrough designation um, had one great um, sort of insight, which was something that was sort of known before, but it's not that something is labeled a breakthrough, but it's that FDA works with the product developer from a very early time in the product development and in a continuing way. And it is that partnership and that, you know, really working together to define what the research agenda should be, mm -hmm. what are the making sure that the company clearly knows what kinds of questions, what are the questions that are going to be asked that need to be answered and what are the most efficient ways to get there. Um, and, you know, I think that, that that to me is one of the signals about how the FDA, in partnership with stakeholders, over time has to develop. And I think, you know, it's on track, but it, it, it actually requires different organization and staffing and resources. But it is, it's that, you know, really working in a much more collaborative way and breaking down mm. those silos that's crucial. But the harder part is really, you know, when you have a really important unmet need, but you don't necessarily have companies that are going to be interested in investing in those products. Hmm. How do you how do you create the the pull and I guess some push mechanisms hmm. to to do that? And there have been strategies that have been tried, and some you know 
have had some value, like for neglected tropical diseases and priority vouchers. But I think we still, I think it's a mm. big gap and we need, you know, people like Amitabh to be mm. working hard to help us figure out, That's you know, what are right. some of those, yeah. those incentives. Yeah. Would, it be, would it be fair to say the FDA has probably been more innovative than the pharma companies have in meeting those uh, Well, I think FDA outcomes? sits in a very unique position because we can look out on one side and see what's in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. And we can look out on the other side and see, you know, what, what is the burden the gaps, of disease yeah, yeah. and the gaps. And, um, and, and so I think the FDA, you know, certainly while I was there, I viewed it as part of my responsibility to try to create some bridges and to, to try to facilitate progress in some of those areas. And certainly some companies are, are very eager to make a contribution, even if it's not going to show up in their, you know, their shareholder benefit column, um, you know, and there are coming. I mean, look at at Merck with the Ebola vaccine. You right, know, right. that's not going to ultimately be a big money maker for them, but but they're sticking with it, and you know, frankly, they're getting a lot of criticism because they're not, you know, going fast mm -hmm. enough, and they've had some manufacturing problems, and the the vaccine has to be stored, you know, at sub-zero temperatures, which in sub-Saharan Africa is challenging, and all of that. But still, they're in the game, they're and learning, you got to yeah. give them credit. You and J and J yeah. made some huge advances um, in terms of drug-resistant TB, an area that really matters in terms of global burden of disease, and frankly, mm -hmm. ultimately, over time, threat to all of us, mm. and yet it's been neglected. And when I was health commissioner in New York City, and we saw a resurgence of tuberculosis and, and drug-resistant tuberculosis, I went to talk to some experts in the field, because frankly, when I was in medical school, I learned about TB only as a disease of historic interest. You know, I knew nothing about TB in the real world. But um, one of those researchers said to me, TB is probably the only field in American medicine where you could have gone to sleep for 20 years and nothing woken changed. up and nothing had changed. Um, but, you know, we're, we're seeing companies, you know, getting into the game, but we don't, we, it's, it's a lot of one-offs. Mm. And I think, you know, we really should be thinking as a society and not just as a, as a, a U.S. society, yeah. um, but as a global community about how can we do a better job. Yeah. And this stuff, this kind of distal stuff that we're hoping to incentivize for, Chris, would you be seeing it right in your institution now? You know, these things that are going to be making a difference in 10, 20 years' time. Oh, you're working on the big questions? We're definitely working on the big questions. Yeah, we don't, we, we don't do little questions. But, and that's, that's really our remit. And I, I say this all the time. We have the privilege to do that because we don't have a short-term commercial imperative that are all of our commercial colleagues do so I that 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 we we would be it would be unethical for us uh, to, to do otherwise I think um, uh, but I, I, I do I, in, in the science you know there's a lot of really rich science which has to go on in this space but I do worry about the this this the the, the social mismatch uh, and and I, there is an experiment going on right now it's called alzheimer's disease uh, where this is going on um, and some of you may have been at a, there's an alzheimer meeting that andrew lowe and ken kosick ran a couple of weeks ago and it's an ongoing series and uh, the data in that field uh, is even more depressing than most in my field of neurology, um, which is uh, whether you look at Al you know, Alzheimer or Huntington's or ALS or stroke or brain tumors, you know, it's, it's, really nothing has changed for the most part since uh, despite, uh, you know, in the clinical practice, despite 30 years of effort and a lot of work. And, and what's happened in the Alzheimer's space uh, is recently there has been an enormous push from the NIH budget. So Congress has really gotten concerned about this because of the, the fiscal implications uh, and, uh, and so has quadrupled the National Institute of Aging budget for Alzheimer's disease, quadrupled it from 600 million to 2.4 billion in three years. And so it's much like what happened with AIDS uh, is now happening in Alzheimer's disease. Um, but but what, what's striking is that, that, as you probably know, most of the companies have gotten out of this space for very good reason. Uh, you know, if you look, um, if you forget about memantine for a second, that, you know, the, the, that, that is 100% failure rate mm -hmm. in that space. And it's really hard, no matter how socially responsible you are, to make an argument to your investors 
that you are being a good uh, fiduciary steward of their investments by investing in this field. So, so there is, there's a lot of push now, um, but, uh, but, but the pull continues to worry us. And so, you know, we've been looking at things like, well, the Orphan Drug Act really did work. I don't think it's just because of the Orphan Drug Act. I think it turned out actually to be somewhat easier, and we do a lot of this uh, uh, because the biology is simpler. Uh, and oh, by the way, you can charge 100 times as much as you do uh, for some other medicines. And so that plays a huge role in this. Um, I really don't think you're going to be able to do that in Alzheimer's disease. You look at what happened with Savaldi, I know that, that's probably not going to happen. Uh, but that's why I, 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 when we think about innovation, I think uh, the, it really has to be what we've been talking about for the last 40, 55 minutes, which is that uh, th this is much more of a team sport than, uh, than the relay race that, that it has been uh, for, for most of the history, right? I mean, when I was at Merck, you know, 20 years ago, it was, you know, we, we would read the nature paper and we would do everything else. Uh, and, and for a variety of reasons, that just doesn't work anymore. And I think the, the public sector is, is stepping up to do more of this work, needs to do that, uh, 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 more of the science and the organization of this space. Uh, there are foundations that are working in this space. Uh, but I don't think it's fair, actually, to our pharma colleagues who have to report to their shareholders, let's be realistic, um, uh, that, to, to solve all of these problems. Uh, Alzheimer's is also, I think, a good example of what we were talking about earlier about innovation that matters, because certainly I heard a lot of pressure about if it wasn't for the FDA, we'd have Alzheimer's yeah, drugs. Yeah, yeah. And um, that, my favorite <laughs> comment was if it wasn't for the fe having a female FDA commissioner, we'd have a cure for cancer. But, <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, but, you know, with Alzheimer's... We need some innovation in that space. Yeah, we need that. Right. So we just, oh, this, but, you know, thinking. you can yeah. easily imagine a, a push to move drugs into the marketplace um, more quickly mm -hmm. yeah. with lower standards yeah. because there aren't other treatment yes. options. Right. And my mom died of Alzheimer's, so I know how desperately you're yes. looking for something that might work. Yeah. But, but an expensive Alzheimer's drug that doesn't work yeah, right. would break that. the bank yeah. um, in every state across the nation, yeah. and it wouldn't serve those patients well. Yeah. Um, and it would probably chill future innovation yeah. as well yeah. because... Yeah. Um, and, that, and that's part of the ecosystem that we need to look at is, because, yeah. you know, uh, it's an Alzheimer's drug that, that, that's also expensive. You know, and if you remove that constraint, then suddenly things get uh, very different. I'm just being mindful of time. I'd like to ask each of the panelists one last question, which is a kind of money ball question. You know, the who gets on first kind of question. If you were able to measure one thing within the biomedical informa information ecosystem, only one thing that you would hope to improve over the years, what would it be? Um, I don't know who wants to go first with this. Why one thing? No, because it was like we're the, all going to live a long the, time. The, uh, we've, we've just been trying to convince yeah, you that yeah. this is a complex a, issue yeah, that yeah. requires yeah. an ecosystem. And then I asked you for one and thing. Now you're trying yeah, to yeah, make us yeah. do one thing. So I want you to simplify it down to one thing that you could actually measure instead of the nice squishy stuff that, that, that I'm a tab describe. Yeah. Well, so um, my answer is the one I closed with, which is I would like to measure the gap between the social burden of disease and where the biopharma med tech innovation is happening. So just that, you know, I'd want it to be a 45 degree line and it's sort of not even a, a five degree line right now. Cool, see, you can't do it more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who wants to go next? Uh, this may be a little surprising, but I, I, I think the, the, the most disruptive technology that we see, uh, believe it or not, is patient involvement. And, and I'm not, and I, you know, I would say, I say that at every meeting. It's not just because I happen to be here. It's, it, <laughs> we don't have time. It's a different panel why that is. Yeah. But, but we're trying to measure, much like Faster Cures, you know, wh how, what does that mean? Because I think it solves a myriad of problems. So I'll just leave it at that. Cool. Thank you. Two things. I agree. Jennifer, yeah. I was yeah. going to say patient engagement because it will also help priority set yes, exactly. the targets yeah. that you look yeah. at and the design of the trials yeah. and everything else. Um, and I think... I just want to emphasize that I do think it's important to look at the process used to innovate, not just whether we fill an unmet need, because we need to maintain trust in the system so that people don't opt out, right? So we don't have things like vaccine hesitancy yeah. and mm -hmm. DIY. I mean, yeah, I, 
we're all for, I mean, that's a big thing. Patient engagement is, is a big thing in Amgen. I, I, would say, I think what I would add is, which was mentioned briefly earlier, is, and I'm not sure exactly how we'd measure this, but not just looking at the value of our innovation to individual patients, but the value to society as a whole. Mm -hmm. I think because there are aspects of value to society that are not in the equations that we typically yep. use for value. Yep. When we're talking about outcomes and costs. Yep. There's things around society as a whole that we're not including yep. in there that I think we need to include. That's right. Yeah, for sure. And I feel like I'm old enough that even though you told me to do one, I, you know, I can just say no. <laughs> but, um, but I would say, I mean, I, I, I do think that this rethinking in terms of both, I, I really you know, care deeply, as I've said, about the ecosystem conceptualization, but with the patient at the center and the driver. Um, and I would say if I had to pick one word as opposed to one thing to measure, it would be integrity, integrity mm -hmm. of science, integrity mm -hmm. of, of commitment. Um, to you know, make doing everything that we can to get better, safer, cheaper products to people, people quicker, and um, and you know, I th I think that uh, we are moving in the right direction in many areas, and I would I think also you know, it's not a question of, of something proactive that we measure, but going back to the notion of failure. I think we also have to do a better job at learning from our mistakes Absolutely. and more yeah. transparency. Yeah. For sure, which I think was the message of advancing, right? Yep. Everyone needs yep. advancing in their titles. That's, the, uh, that's one of the outcomes. Um, this has been a privilege for me to share a stage with the five of you, and I'm assuming everyone else feels the same about it, so thank you. Thank you.